What I'm going to try to do today is talk a little bit about implicit cognition, though uh, fortunately for me, uh, some of that's already been covered. Uh, I want to talk about one domain of implicit cognition that's relevant today, and it's just one of many, and that happens to be the link between implicit cognition and smoking motivation. And I'll be talking about uh, several different tasks that have been used throughout the literature to try to examine implicit measures. And finally, my time will run up and I'll scream out a few future directions. Okay. By now, I think people have a decent sense of this declarative or explicit type of, of measure. And the simplest way for me to describe it is if I want to get an, ex an explicit measure of the degree to which you're experiencing craving, I might say to you, how strong is your craving? And that's a pretty clear indication if you respond to that, that you're giving an explicit measure. You're aware of what it is I'm, I'm asking about. Um, similarly, have you thought a lot about drinking would be an explicit measure of the degree to which you're focused on your drinking. In contrast, the idea that uh, the information that is being revealed is outside of your awareness is, is not a new idea. It's been around for quite a while. And um, essentially what happens is we might ask people questions or we'll look at performance on something and use that information to infer something about these internal states. And uh, more recently, this type of work has made its way into the addictions field. Now, uh, in a, this book chapter that I just mentioned is coming out in a book that uh, Raynaud Wears and Alan Stacy are editing. And in the uh, uh, first chapter of the book, they note a number of advantages of this type of implicit assessment. And I just borrowed a few of them. But I think they're very provocative and, and worth um, quite a bit of research, I would suspect. One is that implicit measures may, in fact, assess cognitive processes that we're not always able to introspect, or at least accurately introspect. Um, they also may be less sensitive to certain types of distortions that we know exist with self-report, explicit types of measures. And perhaps most intriguingly, the idea has been put forth that perhaps implicit and explicit measures may in fact tap into different aspects of behavior. So I'm going to mention again work with cigarette craving or smoking motivation and largely because that's where I've done most of my work in this area. Um, craving has been linked to addiction in a number of different ways, and I don't have enough time to go into detail, but there have been at least a few studies showing links to uh, predicting relapse as well as uh, treatments that actually create cravings and then try to reduce them. So clearly it's important to know how to measure craving, and by and large it's been measured using self-reports, which while I use them and many people use them, they're nevertheless not the gold standard. They're not a perfect measure for reasons I've already mentioned. And it's been suggested by many different groups that uh, perhaps a better way to look at it is to have a broad-based, multi-dimensional approach to the assessment of craving, which may in fact include implicit cognition as part of that. Now, um, during craving, it's been suggested that smokers report that their attention is easily captured by smoking-related stimuli. The idea would be that if you haven't smoked all day because you've been in here and you walk out of this uh, conference center today, you might suddenly notice the cigarette butts on the sidewalk that perhaps you hadn't noticed when you first walked in. The idea that your attentional resources are demanded toward certain types of stimuli in your environment. We call that attentional bias. And we can use these implicit measures to get at that. I'm going to talk first about the color naming task. And essentially, this task has been around for a while. Sometimes people call it the emotional Stroop test, if you're familiar with that. A number of different theories are, uh, have been proposed to explain it. The one that I'm comfortable with is the idea that words that have personal relevance may create interference. Later today, for example, if you're having a conversation on one side of the room and you suddenly hear your name mentioned on the other side of the room in a different conversation, you might suddenly notice it and have a little bit more difficulty continuing your original conversation. There will be interference. And it's that degree of interference that we can capture using this color naming task. So the simple way to do this task is a word <coughs> flashes on the screen. And you are told simply say the color, identify the color of the letters, but ignore word content. Whoops. And in this first size, you say white. In this case, you'd say red. And you might take a little bit longer to say red because it's personally relevant to you. So 
we can use that type of color naming task. And what we find is, first of all, when smokers do this, they tend to take longer to respond to the words that are smoking related than non-smokers. And by and large, when smokers are in a deprived state, they take even longer to respond than they do when they're in a non-deprived state, although not every study has found that. So Andrew Waters and I, along with Saul Schiffman and, and his colleagues, uh, wanted to look at the degree to which this might have some predictive utility, this color naming task. And in a study that came out in health psychology a couple of years ago, we had smokers who were beginning a, a quit. They performed this color naming task on the first day of their quit. And what we looked at was the degree to which this interference on this task would predict time to relapse using Saul Schiffman's fairly elaborate uh, uh, diary system, some of you may be familiar with. And in fact, that's what we found. Interference was linked to uh, time to relapse. I'm going to talk even more briefly about um, another task that's been used for uh, quite a while in cognitive psychology, and in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, it's been used in addiction. The dual task paradigm, essentially, you're doing two things at once, and when you do two things at once, there's some sort of, uh, some sort of a burden that it can be assessed. And in this case, the second task is simply hitting a a uh, mouse button every time you hear a tone. And if you're distracted, it takes you longer to do that. And I'll show you an example in a moment of one of our subjects. Um, and what we have found is that when people are holding a lit cigarette and they haven't smoked all day, it takes them longer to hit these tones than if they're holding a control cue. But perhaps more interestingly, across several different labs, when you look at these high craving situations when people are holding lit cigarettes and, and they're abstinent, um, these reaction time increases tend to be significantly correlated with their self-reports of urge. Here's an example from uh, many years ago. I'm starting to get old. Uh, this is a woman. She's holding a lit cigarette in one hand. She's listening to tones in the other, and that's an example of what we're talking about. I don't have time today to talk about my research with facial coding, but I also use Paul Ekman's facial action coding system to code the facial expressions during craving. We won't talk about that today. Other implicit measures, I've mentioned a couple so far. There are some really exciting ones being um, uh, put into the literature right now that I'm just going to throw on the screen for people to look at. I've not worked with those myself, but I suspect there's going to be some, already there are some really interesting and converging findings with the visual dot probe task, eye tracking, implicit association, attitude tests, and so forth. But at least I wanted to get it out there. There are many more types of implicit tasks than the ones I've worked with. I do, however, want to finish with um, what I would consider less traditional implicit measures. Some would suggest they're not implicit. These are actually self-report measures. However, I see them much the way I would see something like the following. Uh, research has asked um, people to rate the loudness of noises, and they've used that rating to infer mood. That is, the louder you rate the noises, the more negative your mood appears to be. And with that logic, I think we can sometimes recognize that an explicit measure of, say, the loudness of the noise may, in fact, be an implicit measure of some other underlying process. In this case, smoking motivation, we've asked a couple of questions. We've asked people to tell us what they like and what they dislike about smoking, very simply. That's what we call response generation. We've also provided them with smoking consequences questionnaires, uh, which include positive and negative outcomes, and asked them how likely are these outcomes. And what we want to see is when they're in high craving states, do they respond differently than when they're in low craving states? And in fact, we do find evidence for both of those types of response generation and response evaluation. That is to say, the more, um, when you're in a craving state, the more attractive elements of smoking become more salient to you in terms of what you generate as well as the probability of what you think will happen. I think this is actually quite consistent with what Alan Marlott was saying a lot longer, 20 years ago. He talked about the bolstering tactics in craving, such that we distort the probability of certain outcomes and enhance the drug's attractiveness. So finally, in conclusion, before I get beeped, I think implicit, uh, implicit uh, cognition and, and addiction is certainly in its infancy. I think there's some evidence that craving enhances attentional bias um, and that it may even have some predictive utility. Craving also uh, appears to lead, lead one to selectively process information in such a way that it, smoking seems to be more attractive at that moment. Um, but I want to, again, note that the findings aren't all uh, consistent with that. And lastly, I would just say that uh, I think we need to do a lot more 
work, making sure that when we apply these cognitive tasks into work with patients, that we recognize some of the challenges. We need to consider the reliability of the measures. We need to think about how the initial stimuli are responded to relative to the ones that come later that might be actually a different process once people are clued into what's happening. And just in general, there are a lot of special aspects of working with addiction that haven't been taken into account when these measures were first put together. And I think they require more research. Thank you.